This is Rummy's Corner. Rummy's Corner. This past Saturday, in a bout that was broadcast in the U.S. on ESPN Plus pay-per-view, in front of 94,000 screaming fans at Wembley Stadium, Tyson Fury successfully defended the WBC and Lineal Heavyweight World Championship when he scored a sixth round technical knockout against Dillian White, compliments of a sneaky, well-placed uppercut. In the post-fight interview, Fury continued to suggest that this may well have been his final bout inside the squared circle. Absolutely bonkers. I'm not sure if Fury is just taking the piss, but frankly, I do not believe we have seen the last of him. Indeed, I'm not even sure if Fury himself believes it. It might just be a case of him flexing those stellar self-promotion muscles, where it's more of a marketing leverage play for down the line. Something out of the playbook from the great Floyd Mayweather Jr. himself, perhaps, where he leveraged his star power into becoming the richest prize fighter in history. Fury is conceivably on the brink of a similar type of breakthrough, and I believe he knows this all too well. And on the off chance Fury genuinely believes that this is the end, I suspect he may well change his mind sooner than later. But if this is indeed the end of the road for Tyson Fury as a boxer, where does he stand when compared to the great heavyweight champions of the past? It is a difficult question to answer, but let's judge him by what he has done in his era. I still remember way back before his first fight with Derek Chisora. Around that time, the undefeated Chisora was slated to face Vladimir Klitschko in December 2010, and that fight got postponed and ultimately called off. Vladimir instead went on to fight David Hay in a unification bout that July, and Klitschko beat Hay by 12-round unanimous decision. A few weeks later, Fury faced Chisora, and I remember at the time it seemed the large majority were assuming Chisora would win. In fact, a lot of people thought of Fury as someone like the new Ty Fields. In a chorus of most favoring Chisora, I remember late great Hall of Fame trainer Emmanuel Stewart being one of the few predicting a Fury victory, and he said he believed this because Fury had unbelievable mental determination. And I remember thinking, hmm, well that's interesting. Sure enough, Fury put on a terrific performance, and Emmanuel's endorsement of Fury stuck with me. A couple of years later, there was the fight against former two-time cruiserweight champion Steve USS Cunningham. Cunningham was a very talented boxer, but he was fighting above his optimal weight class, he was getting up there in age, and he was always known for being a sharp puncher with great timing, but he was never known as a tremendous power puncher. But his impeccable timing was on full display, and he nailed Fury and dropped him in round two with a mean clubbing right. Fury rose, persevered, and started using his massive size to his advantage before stopping Cunningham several rounds later. Many fans were claiming that Fury was exposed as someone who lacked the punch resistance to succeed as an elite heavyweight, and there were definitely a lot of questions about his future prospects. A couple of years after that, Fury found himself in position to challenge long-reigning heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko. At that time, Klitschko was in the midst of a reign that lasted nearly a decade, during which time he accumulated 18 consecutive title defenses. Only the great Joe Lewis and the great Larry Holmes ever had more. But still, at this time, Vladimir was still seemingly head and shoulders above the rest of the competition, even if he was starting to show his age. And I confess, I fell into the trap of thinking that if Cunningham dropped him, that sooner or later, Vlad would bludgeon him with a booming big right or a snappy left hook. The size, the experience, the methodical technical offensive surgery, one-punch knockout power in both hands. I just didn't think Fury would be able to cope with Vladimir's ample offense. And I said as much in one of my earliest prediction videos on this channel, proving I've never known shit about boxing. 
Fury put on a fine display in the art of dictating the distance against a man whose own mastery of controlling the distance had enabled him to become one of the longest reigning champions in history. Fury did not do a whole lot offensively, but he never needed to because Vladimir was absolutely befuddled and uncharacteristically confused. Klitschko was never able to unload his potent offense because Fury proved to be too damn slippery with the mesmerizing herky-jerky movement, the offbeat rhythm with terrific head and upper body movement, ace-level fainting, and good footwork with deceptive overall quickness. Fury never really needed to take it out of first gear, and Vladimir had no answers for Fury's hypnotic tactics. I don't know if Fury ever got the full credit he deserved for that victory. To be sure, Vlad was older, and heavyweights in their late 30s historically tend to be on the slide. Whether it's Joe Lewis losing against Rocky Marciano, or Muhammad Ali losing against Larry Holmes, or the Eastern Assassin himself getting stopped by a prime Mike Tyson. In some respects, Vlad does fit that type of historical mold, and that should certainly be taken into consideration. But all the same, Fury was the only one during a long stretch to completely shut down Vlad's world-class offense. Some people, even some fans whose boxing opinions I respect a great deal, have claimed that AJ's subsequent win against Vlad was a better win. I respectfully and strongly disagree. The fight with Joshua was more exciting and more dramatic, in large part because it was far more competitive. Fury coasted in first gear to outbox Vlad, and AJ wound up in a prolonged war of attrition which, to his credit, he prevailed. Fury was unceremoniously stripped of the IBF, and he later vacated the WBO and the WBA Super Duper. Then Fury was battling some personal demons around the time he had his license suspended by the British Boxing Board of Control, and a rematch with Vladimir never happened, and Fury wound up being out of the ring for almost three years before he finally returned to action, where he had gained a great deal of weight since beating Vladimir. But Fury was on the comeback trail, and he would get a shot for the only title he had never won when he challenged WBC heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder in December 2018. This would kick off the defining heavyweight trilogy in this era. In the first fight, Fury was outboxing Wilder for the majority of rounds. But Wilder dropped him twice along the way, including a brutal knockdown in the 12th and final round, where Fury exhibited the exact type of mental determination Emmanuel was talking about all those years earlier. And Fury actually finished the round strong. A lot of people, myself included, believed that Fury deserved the victory in that one. But the official judges saw it differently, and the fight was ruled a draw. As fate would have it, Fury teamed up with Emmanuel's nephew, Sugar Hill, for the rematch. And Fury put on an absolute masterclass in this one, dropping Wilder twice along the way before his corner threw in the towel when Wilder was getting worked over in round 7. Their incredible third encounter solidified this as one of the greatest and most memorable heavyweight trilogies of all time. Both boxers showed tremendous heart and courage in this one, which was an absolute war in a battle of wills. Fury had Wilder down in round three, and then Wilder had Fury down twice in round four, which completely changed the tide. The two continued battling it out, and Fury would reseize the momentum. He dropped Wilder hard in round 10, and then again in round 11 before the fight was stopped by the referee. Make no mistake, the trilogy between Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder is indeed the defining boxing rivalry in this era, and it absolutely deserves to be mentioned alongside the greatest trilogies in the long rich history of heavyweight boxing. That leads us into the fight against Dillian White. I thought at times White had the right general idea, even if I think his execution could have been better. But at the end of the day, Fury made it look pretty easy. 
Fury exhibited good footwork, and he was able to largely neutralize most of White's attacks through a blend of good movement, a versatile jab, and he was frequently catching White with short hooks on the way in and the occasional right hand. White was trying his best, but the difference in class was apparent. Fury's footwork looked excellent, and his head and upper body movement appeared better than it had in his third fight against Deontay. Fury was using his trademark feints behind that herky-jerky style, and meanwhile he was gauging White's reactions. Fury was smart and effective. He was reading White in such a way that he was beginning to predict his movements. This paved the way to the trap which saw the fight-ending uppercut. If this really is the end for Fury, he has had a wonderful career. More of a quality over quantity thing, but he ended the nearly 10-year reign of Vladimir Klitschko. He ended the 5-year reign of Deontay Wilder. He won the error-defining trilogy against Wilder. And now he beat a consensus top 5 contender in Dillian White, and he made it look easy. Fury doesn't have the depth or the quantity to stack up against a lot of heavyweight champions from the past, but he easily holds claim to at least three of the four top heavyweight victories in the last seven years or more. A lot of his detractors downplay these wins, saying Vlad was too old and Wilder was overrated, and there may be some truth in those claims. But for me, it doesn't change the fact that the history books will list Fury as the man who dethroned these two long-reigning champions. Fury has thus far proven to be the best heavyweight of this generation, bar none. And if Fury does retire, he will forever have that mythical aura that always seems to surround the few boxing greats who have retired from the sport without suffering a loss. But the thing of it is, he can truly seal the deal with just one more fight, one more victory, one more big-time payday and one legacy-defining exclamation point. Fury knows this. To truly solidify his place as the undisputed heavyweight king in this era, he needs to beat Alexander Usyk, or in the event Joshua avenges his previous loss, then AJ. Assuming Usyk AJ2 does indeed happen in July, the dream scenario for boxing fans is that the winner of that fight will square off against Fury later this year for undisputed heavyweight supremacy. No doubt Fury understands the historic upside of having just one last fight, and if he does indeed have a real exit strategy from boxing, I have to believe it involves a comeback for the one big heavyweight showdown that will get the attention of the entire boxing world and beyond. If this is the end for Fury, he was a highly skilled and talented boxer who will likely be remembered with a lot of questions about what could have been. That will be the case whether he retires or not, but if he hangs around for one more fight against the winner of the Usyk-Joshua rematch, and if he can emerge victorious, then he will have undoubtedly solidified his spot as the best heavyweight of this era beyond reproach. Will he really retire? Only time will tell. But for my official prediction, I think we will see him at least once more. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed and have a wonderful night. This is Rummy's Corner.